Welcome everyone. Thanks for coming today. It's been, I hope you're having a great event. Uh, we've been in Paris for a few days now, so uh, we're heading to Prague tomorrow, but it's been really great. We had a really great time here. Uh, Amy presented at ZenCon the other day, which is... Anybody see Amy's talk at ZenCon? No? Okay, all right. So we're doing, we're doing something different anyway, so this is a completely different talk. We're going to be talking about building scalable PHP applications using Google's App Engine. So how many people have heard of App Engine? Okay, how many people have actually used App Engine? Okay, so more people have heard of it than used it. So, okay, so we're going to be talking about App Engine and how you can build scalable PHP applications on App Engine. And so one of the first questions, and this is kind of a marketing slide, but it's not really, it's putting this into perspective. Uh, why would you want to run PHP in the cloud? How many people run PHP in the cloud today? Okay, not so many of you. Okay, so what are the cases for, what are the benefits for running PHP in the cloud today? Now one of them is the scale and demand. And some people think when I talk about this that I'm really talking about the ability to handle massive traffic spikes. But we're not really talking about that. We're talking about the ability to have the resources available to service the traffic demand coming to your app. That means scaling up when needed, scaling down when needed, to save you money, to make sure you only have the resources needed uh, to service the traffic demand. Another great benefit is, particularly with the Google Cloud, is you have that very fast access to Google scale, uh, cloud scale services. Things like Maps API, YouTube API, Google Plus, and other APIs such as our cloud data store uh, that are massively scalable and very quick to access for mapping. Also, the cloud gives you the benefits of being able to focus on developing your application, developing your business logic, your prime logic, the prime application code for your app. Not so much having to worry about building systems or, in the case of a platform as a service offering such as App Engine, configuring software stacks. You don't have to worry about those things when you're developing the cloud. So you can just spend all your time developing your application. Then we have analytics. So, Analytics, big data is really here now. It's really arrived. And you're going to want to gather as much data as possible about the way your application is being used, about how users interact with your application. And then you're going to want to store that data and then run analytics over it to give yourself an insight into how your application behaves. And then you can improve your application and greatly enhance the user engagement. And finally, global availability. Now you want the guy accessing your app in Korea to have exactly the same experience as a lady accessing the application in South Carolina. So global availability, again, on the Google Cloud, this is a massive benefit. Uh, you can have your application located pretty much anywhere. Uh, the user connects to the Google front end and have immediate access to the Google network and very fast connectivity to your application. So there's some of the benefits of running PHP in the cloud. App Engine itself uh, has a, some real key benefits, and that's why we want to talk about it, and that's why this is all worthwhile. So again, the ability to scale is very important with App Engine. We have a slide coming up that's going to talk about its ability to auto scale. It's also very easy to develop with App Engine. Uh, it's free to start. We have a free tier. You don't have to put your billing, uh, your billing information in, credit card details. You can start for free today. Uh, it has a local development environment that can be used uh, to develop your applications locally on your own machine, uh, do iterative development, and then deploy to App Engine. And then we have these massive service abstractions as well. And we have very simple ways of getting to services. Uh, some of these uh, mapped to PHP calls, uh, as Amy's going to talk about later. Some of them are just massive service abstractions anyway, like access to our data store. Then it's also trivial to manage. It's a fully managed service. You don't have to worry about uh, maintaining the runtime. Uh, we do that for you. No patches. You don't have to apply patches. You may have to patch your own code, of course. And of course, it runs 24 7. And it's maintained by these things, these guys called SREs, uh, Site Reliability Engineers. And they're really great, they're really fantastic at what they do, and they're one of the key features that we try to promote with App Engine. You get these guys for free. But let's talk about autoscale with App Engine. Uh, so, again, it's not about just handling big spikes in demand, it's about having the capacity that you need when you need it. And in this case, we have two examples volatile demand fluctuation on the left hand side. In this case, we have a traffic demand that's going up, going down very rapidly, dips and spikes, uh, strange curves. And in this case, we could over-provision for those spikes. So we have a large capacity, and we'll be able to deal with those spikes great. But in the blue, dot, uh, the blue dotted line area, we have capacity that's not being used. 
that's not really good, very good for us because we're paying for that capacity. It could be in the cloud, it could be machines in a data center. With App Engine, App Engine will follow that curve for you. So App Engine will have the resources you need when you need them. So when the spike happens, App Engine will rapidly adapt to that and have the instances available uh, to service those requests. And when it goes away again, App Engine will very rapidly tear those instances down and you'll pay for only what you need. On the right hand uh, left, the right hand side, if you're looking at it, we have an exponential growth curve. In this case, we have a stair step uh, provisioning of capacity. We start off where we have too much capacity, and that's the step at the bottom. Uh, then the growth occurs, and we find we don't have enough capacity. So at this point, we start experiencing downtime, high latency for re user requests. So we provision more instances. And again, now we have more instances than we need, more resources than we need. And at some point, the curve catches us up again and we have to go through the same process, iteratively. So with App Engine again, we'll track the demand, and only have the resources you need when you need them. <coughs> we talked about cloud-scale services, and there's a bunch of services App Engine has available. Uh, some of them are just there to make your life easier. Some of them are really cool, because they give you access to features that you wouldn't have access, have access to otherwise. We have storage options. Cloud Data Store is the App Engine native data store. <coughs> which from PHP is accessed via an API. Then we have Cloud SQL, which is MySQL in the cloud, effectively. And that's a managed service. And again, Amy's going to talk more about that shortly. And also Cloud Storage, which is a bucket-based store. Uh, this allows you to store unstructured data, uh, huge amounts of data, any, any size data you like, up to five terabytes of an object. Then we have various other services, such as Memcache, task queues, again, one of Amy's favorites. This is going to talk extensively about that. Cron jobs to run scheduled jobs. User service for authentication and mail for sending mail messages. And also page speed. Page speed up there, uh, to optimize serving of requests. That's a paid for service. So, why PHP? Uh, did anybody actually vote for having PHP uh, implemented in Apogee? Hey, why well don't guys? So, thanks for that. That was really good. We actually made it happen. So, PHP was the top feature request for Apogee. So, now it's probably Ruby or something like that. Now we're going to look at a real-world example of converting an application. This is just an example. It's basically there to show you not how to convert joined in the application you've been using uh, throughout the conference to uh, manage the event. It's not how to convert joined in to run an application. It's how to convert your own applications. So while we're going through this talk, and my name is talking for this, think about how this would apply to your own applications and what you would need to do. It's a good starting point. There may be other things you need to do, but uh, we're going to talk quite a lot of detail about what changes you need to make to make it work. So I'm going to hand you over to Amy. I need to hand over the clicker, but she can't talk in a second of this. Over to you, Amy. Cheers. Thanks, Mandy. Okay, so you're probably all familiar with Joined In. And as Mandy said, this is a good app to, to sort of go through the exercise with. It's, it's a real-world app. It's open source. We're all familiar with it. And the things that we're going to show are going to be applicable to your own apps. OK. So first, let's talk just a little bit about the environment that you'll be running on, on App Engine. So App Engine currently runs PHP 5.4. And it's, it's just regular PHP. We needed to make a few changes to essentially kind of hook it into the App Engine platform. And we've open sourced that. So you can look at it on GitHub and, and see the small changes that we made. And 5.5 uh, five is on the roadmap. <laughs> In terms of extensions, we provide a, a whole set of um, the most standard common extensions that, that people like to use with PHP. And we're always looking for feedback. If there's something that you'd like to see that, that we don't provide, um, we really want to hear about it. A good way to do that is to create an external Ish, app engine issue on the issue tracker and um, star it up, just, just like what happened with PHP itself. <laughs> and if, if you want to see what extensions are supported, if you look at the bottom link there, you can um, see the production PHP info, including the list of extensions. Okay, so how do we get started? Well, the first thing to do, um, and for those of you who are familiar with App Engine, you already have done this is make an account on appengine.google.com. This lets you create an app. Um, you generate an App Engine app ID. And 
then you go and set up your project locally. So in the root of your project directory, you always need to have an app.yaml file. And this is a configuration file for your app. And so there's certain stuff that, that always needs to go into that file. And right there is the app ID that you just created over in the admin, uh, admin console. You always specify a version for your app. So an, an app can have multiple versions. And this is actually really nice. We won't have time to go into it today, but you can do things like traffic splitting. You can do A-B testing with multiple versions running at once. So it's actually a really nice feature. And we're specifying the runtime, PHP, of course. And there's a bunch of other configuration information that goes into this file. And one of the key things is the handler specification. So this is, is mapping matched URLs to their handlers. So, so what you're seeing in this particular specification here is that anything that's prefixed with, with INC is going to be treated as static files. So this is your JavaScript, your CSS files. And then um, these are evaluated sequentially. So the bottom regular expression is saying anything else, we're just going to map to be handled by index.php. OK. And then one other thing that we need to pay attention to for joined in is we, we need to create a php.ini file and put it in the same root directory. And this is because we need to enable a function that App Engine has disabled by, by default. This is something that Code Igniter needs enabled. OK, so, so we're ready to go. And so we try to deploy our application. And I'm, I'm not going to go through the, the process here, but it's really easy to do. There's an SDK that lets you do local development, and there's a launcher that lets you do essentially push button deploys. So we deploy our app, and we see this error right away. Well, it turns out what's going on is related to joined ins logging. App Engine does not let you write to the local file system, it lets you read, but not write. And this is for um, security and scalability reasons. And in fact, if, if you think about it a bit, you can see how this is actually, um, the fact that you can't write to the local file system is actually ruling out a whole class of exploits, in fact. So um, for logging, what do we do instead? We are going to use syslog. And any calls to syslog are actually logged to the App Engine admin console, sort of your control center for seeing what's, what's going on with the app. I showed you a quick screenshot earlier. And so, so we change our logging to use syslog rather than the local file system. And then, as we would, would hope and expect, we start to see logging on the app's admin console. So I, you can't read this, but, but this is exactly what you're seeing here. So, now all the logging is, is going to our admin console. So we're in pretty good shape now. We, we can start to see what's going on with the app if we get errors. OK, so we fix the logging. We deploy again. Hmm. OK, now, now we're getting a database error. But this is actually not surprising, because we, we didn't really do anything to configure the database yet. So with App Engine apps, when you're developing locally, you can, can just use a local MySQL install. For deployed apps, which is what we're talking about here, what you do is you use Cloud SQL. So this is part of the Cloud Platform. Mandy mentioned it earlier. And it's a managed, distributed uh, SQL database. It's MySQL under the hood. And so we'll, we'll need to set up a Cloud SQL instance for our joined-in app. So the, the way you do that is you go to the Cloud console. When you make an App Engine app, um, an associated cloud project gets created automatically for you. And so we'll go to the console for that project and we'll create a cloud SQL instance. The documentation walks, this, uh, walks you through this in uh, gory detail, so I, I won't go through it here. But it's very straightforward. You create a cloud SQL instance, you name it, and then you need to configure it so that it accepts connections from your app engine app ID. So you, you need to set things up so that the Cloud SQL instance is accepting um, communications from your App Engine app. 
And after you do that, it, um, everything, because it's MySQL under the hood, everything works pretty much as you expect. It'll be a familiar environment. The one thing that you need to pay attention to is just how you specify the host name. And this is the syntax for it here. So you'll, you'll need to know your project ID, which, which will be clear from you for, from all your console information, and you'll need to know the name of the Cloud SQL instance that you created. And after that, you're, you're good to go, and everything else is just kind of standard. Okay, so, so now we've got our, our database connected and, and we're talking to it. So the next thing we're gonna pay attention to is how we handle HTTP requests. So the recommended way to do this on App Engine, we're, we're going to take advantage of an App Engine service that um, basically an infrastructure for supporting highly scalable HTTP requests called the URL fetch service. So this is the recommended way to do it. And it's very transparent because um, you just use it via HTTP stream wrappers and the functions that you're used to calling like file get contents. So in, in a few places in the joined in code, then we're going to um, replace calls to FSOC open with file get contents like this. So here we're, we're making a post request to um, defensio.com using file get contents. Okay. All right. So next let's talk about caching. And we actually have uh, several options here. Um, what are those options, Mandy? So I mentioned Google front ends earlier. So we have the Google front ends where it's pretty much the entry point for anybody accessing your service or your application. Uh, and that has the ability to cache data for you. So static content uh, or dynamic requests that have a cache control header set on them can be cached in the Google front end. It's a big global resource. Uh, and also we have some peering relationships with ISPs that allow us to cache uh, data very, very close to the user. So you can take advantage of that. So that's really important. Set the caching up uh, and you can prevent many of these requests from actually hitting the App Engine at all. And then when it comes to data, we have Memcache. Uh, Memcache, uh, we're going to talk about it in more detail, but it's a massive scalable service. It's a distributed service that's available to all of the apps in App Engine. And so eviction can be not necessarily caused by your own application, but can be caused by somebody else's. But it's still huge and it still gives you huge benefits. Uh, but if that's not enough for you, we also have a dedicated memcache service, which has just gone into GA, uh, and that's available and allows you to reserve space in memcache uh, by the gigabyte. Uh, it's a, the cost is a paid service, but it allows you to actually have your own uh, scalable memcache service available to you. Okay, so for joined in, it, it does some caching to the local file system, and, and again, App Engine doesn't allow rights to the local file system. So in, in those cases, we're going to instead just use memcache. And this, this works just out of the box with, with App Engine. There's nothing you need to do at all to configure it. And, and here's an example of, of how you do it. Um, here we're just using, we're generating, um, essentially using the cache path that we're generating as the key. And we're setting the expiration to be 60 seconds. And, and this is all you need to do is memcache. Okay, so yeah, caching under control now. Um, let's next look at how we're going to upload media files. So you know, Im images for, for an event as, as you're configuring for a new event. So how, how are we going to do this? And ag again, we can't write to the local file system. What we're going to do instead is use cloud storage, uh, which Mandy also mentioned earlier. This, so this is, again, part of the Google Cloud Platform suite of technologies. And, and this is an object store, um, distributed, really fast and scalable, it lets you store huge amounts of data if you want to. So we're going to use cloud storage for our media uploads. And App Engine actually makes it super easy to do that. But, but first, let's, let's talk about how you set things up in, um, on the project end. What, what you need to do is define a bucket that you're going to use for your app. So th this is a um, screenshot of the web UI of a particular bucket in cloud storage. You access this to your project cloud console. So, so we've defined a bucket. And then 
um, kind of similarly to Cloud SQL, we need to configure our App Engine app to um, be able to talk to it. So uh, again, this is spelled out in the documentation, but essentially what you need to do is every App Engine app has a so-called service account email, and, and you, you need to add that service account email to the permissions of, of your, your project, the project in, in which you've defined your bucket. And once you do that, App Engine app communicates with your cloud storage bucket without any other configuration required. So, so here's a, a look at what the code would be to do that. There's some helper functions that make this really straightforward. And the, the key one is create upload URL. So we're calling this method and we're, we're passing it the, the name of the bucket that we want to write to. And then we're passing it um, what essentially is a, is a callback URL. And this is, um, this is the event slash edit URL. Th this is going to be called as a um, post request after the, the file uploads with the file information. So create upload URL generates a URL. We use that URL as the action of our form post. And then when the upload completes, the, this uh, callback URL is called as a post request. And from the file super global, you can grab the temporary name in, in your cloud storage bucket of, of where the file was uploaded. And once you have that temporary file name, then you can do whatever you want with it. And um, we provide stream wrappers for cloud storage. So all of your familiar file system functions just work as you would expect. So here we're doing a rename of the temporary file to the file where, where we really want to, to put the upload. And we're, one sort of interesting thing we're doing here is when we do that, we're saying that the file is publicly accessible. That's what the Apple key is doing there. So if you don't say that, then the um, permissions of the file are set so that only the App Engine app can access it. So here we're, we're setting this upload to be publicly accessible. And then we're using uh, one more helper function. And this is actually new to App Engine 188, which just came out a couple days ago. So this is kind of a nice little helper function. You can generate a public URL really easily. You used to sort of have to piece it together by hand. So, so now we make it really easy to do that. And once you have that public URL, you can use it in your page renderings or you should, however you like. OK, so again, stream wrappers to, to make all the familiar uh, file system calls map very transparently to cloud storage. OK. So there's one more thing that we need to pay attention to as we convert our app. And um, this is sending email. So if we try to send email, we, we get this error. What we're going to do to fix that is we're going to use App Engine's mail API. And it's, it's really straightforward to use. Essentially, all you do is, is you create an array that contains the, the information about the message you want to send, the to, the, the subject, et cetera, the body. And you create a new message object, and you just call send. So, so that's sort of the, the core use of the mail API. But let's do something a, a little more interesting here that takes advantage of um, what's actually one of my favorite App Engine features. And um, as Mandy sort of alluded to earlier, I, I could talk all day on this, but, but I won't. And that is task queues. OK, so, so say we want to send um, a whole bunch of emails at once. And if, if you did that, that would be slow. And so what you would like to do is, is you would like to, to be able to sort of decouple things that are slow from the app's request response, the client request response cycle, and, and push stuff like that into the background where, where you can do it asynchronously. So App Engine has a service called Task Queues, which, which makes this really easy to do. Um, and and here, here's a figure of that. We're, we're essentially going to send these emails, this, this bunch of emails that we need to send, we're going to send them in, in the background, decoupled from our client request response cycle. So what would that look like? 
For each email that we want to send, we're, we're going to define a task queue task. These are essentially just units of work. And um, so we're going to def define a new push task. We're going to pass it the worker URL, tasks email, and pass it an optional array of parameters. And then we're just going to add it to App Engine's task queue. Here, here we're using the default queue. You can also define other queues and name them and give them different configuration characteristics. OK, so we're defining a task. For each email we want to send, we're adding them to the task queue. And then they, they run in the background asynchronously. So the, the next piece of the puzzle is, well, how exactly do they run? These are just, um, you already know how to write tasks. These are just request handlers like um, any other request handler. So we're, we're defining a mapping in the app.yaml from tasks email to the email.php script that implements this task. And then here's the task handler itself. And it's, it's just run as a post request. So, um, so we're actually checking first to ensure that it's running as a task in case we don't want the script to run in any other context. And, and then we're just um, treating as we would any other post request. We're grabbing the uh, task payload, the task parameters from the post array, and, and then we're, we're just sending the message. And, and that's all there is to it. it it's really nice and, and powerful. OK. So where have we got to, Mandy? OK. So what we've basically shown here is that that's what you need to do to get joined in running. So uh, at this point, you're going to want to click through everything. You're going to want to test all of the functions, uh, various plugins and such like. You can run the join in. And you're going to want to make sure all of that works. But the basic application has now been converted to run on App Engine. So now, that was an example. But the most important thing is, how would you do that with your own applications? And so the whole process is fairly straightforward. There's the App Engine component. There's a PHP component. There's a data storage component. And for this, you create an App Engine application, as Amy described. You have this configuration file called app.yaml that's specific to App Engine. You also have your php.ini that's also got some uh, Google-specific extensions uh, to it. Then on the PHP side, uh, the various things we've seen are you can use the Streams API to make networks, uh, network calls, uh, make use of this URL fetch service that Amy described. Then also you want to cache everything uh, where possible. You want to make use of the edge caching uh, to reduce the load on your application, ultimately to improve performance and reduce cost. Uh, and you also want to cache to memcache. And again, data store writes, data store reads are fairly expensive. You want to cache wherever possible, cache all your writes, uh, maybe cache through, and then read them back from memcache. Uh, and that will, again, improve your performance, save you money. Uh, use the mail API. Uh, that's a massively scalable service at the back end that you can use to send emails. So if you have an application that, where that's an important part of the application workflow, then making use of this mail API is great. And also then, for the background, we have these task queues. Uh, we have a couple of task queues. Only one of them is available to PHP at the moment, and that's one's called push queues. Uh, but that does a great job of allowing us to push work off outside of the user request. Uh, we can also do things like using long running backends that can save state across user requests as well. Uh, so not only running for uh, just a few minutes outside of the user request, but running forever during the lifetime of the application. And you can also schedule jobs as well using the cron service. Um, all of these things are perfectly suited for running background tasks. Then on the data storage side, we have various options. Uh, we have MySQL, which is effectively, oh, sorry, Cloud SQL, which is effectively MySQL in the cloud, which is perfect for PHP applications. Uh, we support not only MySQL, but also MySQL IA, PDO, all of the popular options for configuring your uh, database connection strings. And also you can make use of the cloud data store. And the cloud data store is effectively what we used to call, or what we call big table internally. Uh, all of our application services touch big table in some way. And it's exposed to App Engine as the cloud data, as the data store, now the cloud data store, which can be accessed outside of App Engine via an API. Ultimately, PHP would have that option as well to access data store directly. But at the moment, it's done through an API called API, uh, the cloud data store API. Okay. Then for file writes and uploads, uh, again, a lot of abstractions done here under the hood. What's familiar to you normally will be abstracted out to cloud SQL. But also for handling file uploads, it's fairly straightforward to actually rewrite the code uh, just to upload the files to cloud storage. And cloud storage is massively quick as well. Once the file's in cloud storage, you can serve it directly from there. 
and get all the benefits of actually the performance that that offers and also not having to serve it from that region. And so kind of finally, before we go into resources and Q&A, uh, we had this offer. Uh, we've already said that App Engine is free to use to begin with. You don't have to understand your billing information. Uh, for other cloud services, you do. But if you want to try them out, you want to kick the tires with those uh, services, such as Cloud SQL, Cloud Data Store, uh, we had this offer, $1,000 worth of credits of, for Google App Engine, and $1,000 for Google Compute Engine, which actually includes all of those other cloud platform services, such as Cloud SQL. That means you can get started, you can get set up. It also includes BigQuery. Anybody heard of BigQuery? A BigQuery is an analytics tool you can use to uh, gain insight from your data, and it's really cool to, to try and use out. So, and also get access to this starter pack. Go to that URL, uh, blue.gull, bc1sa. Is the QR code working for anybody? Well, some, some we'll post there. these slides as well in, yeah. in the joined in page, so you don't need to, to worry about grabbing it now. But the important part is the fhpp.com uh, code, which is the code for this conference. So you just put in that code, that promo code. You have to answer some questions, uh, you have to set up your project so that we can apply the credit, credits, but it's very straightforward. And then we have some resources that Amy's put together, so I'll let Amy talk about those. And, and again, um, we'll post these slides uh, shortly, so, so don't worry about um, <laughs> um, trying to search for any of these. We, we have going, I, I actually work with the, sort of the core um, PHP team, um, part of it's in, in Sydney, where I, I live. And so we, we have a tips and trips, tips and tricks blog going, where we um, just just post information about things that are new um, migrations that, that we've done, things like that. So so that's a good one to track. We we have a um, PHP G plus community, which I see I neglected to, to put there, and I'll, I'll add it before I post the slides. Um, there's some some links to, to sort of the official blogs and, and documentation. And, and some of those links at the bottom might be of interest to those of you who, who want to migrate other apps. So things like WordPress, Drupal, Laravel. We, we've gone through the exercise and, and, and sort of walked you through it. And, and we're always looking for, um, looking to hear from you if you try to, to do another migration, always, always looking for your, for your feedback. We're really interested to, to hear how you're going with this. Yeah, and it's not just about conversion applications as well. It's a great place to start building applications using PHP as well. So we do have other languages, but PHP is extremely popular. So if you want to start your project on uh, App Engine, it's a good place to start. You, again, you need to take into consideration some of the things we talked about today. But beyond that, it's very straightforward. So with that, I think we'll open it up for questions. Anybody? Uh, very easily, please. Come on, ask questions. Hi. Um, you say uh, it's easy to deploy our code with, uh, when we code on local to Google App Engine, but do you pro provide uh, a tool or something to use a version control like GitHub and, uh, or Bitbucket? Uh, yes. So, so let me um, first let me show you the um, the launcher. This is one option. This is and there's command line options as well. Um, so this is sort of push button deploy. We also support Git push to deploy. So so that's really nice. You can essentially have your your app in Git and just um, and, and do the normal Git version control that you used to, and then push it out from your Git repo. Yeah, and for other languages, uh, we have continuous integration options, such as with CloudBees, uh, the Jenkins the Cloud. Uh, they support Python currently and Java, but I don't think they support PHP yet, but we're working with them. Uh, and also tools such as Cloud MV, IDE in the Cloud, that also supports PHP development, as does uh, uh, PHP Storm as well. And, and just uh, as an aside, one, one thing we didn't really have a chance to go into today that I mentioned is that one... A given app can have multiple versions. So um, you can put, push multiple versions out at once. One can be a test version. You can do traffic splitting, and it's pretty flexible in that regard. If you want to interact with the uh, 
the cloud service APIs, how would you do that if you're doing local development? Are there like local stubs you can install? Or you know, how would you do that? To, like on my laptop, I don't have Google's mail front end, for instance. Yeah, the, the development server um, does a pretty good job of, of emulating most of the production environment, including those services. So for, for Cloud SQL, you'd use a local deployment of Cloud SQL. The, the data store uh, for the other languages is actually implemented within the, the development environment, so that's available to you directly. If you want to make calls to other Google services, you're probably best bet is to mock them uh, and stop them out yourself. But I don't think we provide any sub services for other equivalent uh, APIs, do we? Such as like YouTube or um, Mail? What, no. What, um, what would happen with Mail? Um, it, it just has a local step. Right. Essentially, but yeah. Really, for, really okay. yeah. For for PHP development, so, sort of the exception to that is you do need a local install of MySQL. Um, unlike the case if you've done any work with App Engine, um, say on Python, and you, you might know there's a local emulation of the data store. So, so for for any PHP work that um, wants to touch a SQL database, you'll need a local install, but everything else is stubbed out and emulated. Okay, so so you then you will need to use the Google um, local server plus your own MySQL in order to develop for this then? Yeah, the, the local development server um, plus MySQL, yes. Okay. But but PHP itself is bundled with the SDK, so you don't need to install that. Okay. And second question along similar lines. Um, for code that you do want to vary between you know, production and local, like you know, a local config file or something like that, mm -hmm. how would you go about handling those? Uh, like, normally that's the kind of file that logs into the server right directly and not check into version controls, just database credentials, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. What would be the equivalent here? So, so you, you can make a test to determine if you're running locally or in production. And, and, um, and you, you can either, um, just add that logic to your config file, or you could set an environment variable based on that, that that you could access. That doesn't work when you've got 30 developers working on the application on their own local instances. You then have 31 entries in that config file then. Um, perhaps I didn't entirely understand your question. Okay, I can, I can okay. explain. So basically, if you have 31 developers each with their own MySQL instance, uh, they right. have their own connect string for that MySQL instance. How, how would we handle that situation? Interesting question. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Um, the development servers are, are um, somewhat self-contained um, for, for the most part. So, um, yeah, we, perhaps we, we don't have as, as good an answer for that question as we should. Uh, I, I think for, for the most part, it tends not to be an issue. What, with PHP development, you, you need to pay attention to your, your local database access, though. If you want to get my business card off now, I'll, yeah. I'll ask uh, the guys, the PM guys and the engineering team, uh, if they have any suggestions. They, they must do the same thing themselves, uh, yeah. and they may have already covered that. So uh, I'm happy to answer any questions by email. Okay, thank you. Thank you. No problem. Any more questions? Any more questions? <laughs> this one. Google is often distressed for uh, security reasons. Uh, uh, services like the Gmail, other uh, services are thought to be not secure or uh, not confidential and sneaked into by the NSA. What would be your response to uh, that kind of concern? To know if uh, whether or not our application is going to be uh, uh, viewed by the, the NSA or not secure through the cloud? I think uh, we have executives that have actually answered that question in the press before, uh, about particularly about the NSA side of things. Yeah, that we don't provide access to the NSA, uh, and... The NSA was just an example, just in general, uh, right, in general for, but for security and... So I'm not, I, I've not heard any concerns about Gmail security, so if you've got any specific, because Gmail is pretty, pretty darn secure. Uh, I, don't see, I don't think we've had any leaks uh, from Gmail, do you? I mean, you have specific examples, and you'd like to, like to talk about them, I can try to. I don't have specific, specific uh, examples, it's just um, comments that I've heard from various people uh, who do not want to use uh, cloud solutions or uh, especially Google solutions 
uh, because we don't trust it. Okay, so we, we encrypt pretty much everything uh, on disk. Uh, obviously, we have the SSH keys, we have the uh, encryption keys, those kind of things uh, for our uh, SSH keys for our instances. We have the keys for the encryption, uh, but we do encrypt everything pretty much. Uh, so uh, I think we try to be massively secure. We're, we're, we, we really do care about users' data and making sure it doesn't get leaked out, that people don't get access to it in appropriate access. So I think we go a long way to actually do that. But I mean, I can't really speak at, at length or at depth about what we do specifically to make that happen, but I think we can probably refer you to places where uh, we've, we've spoken on this at length before. And let me make, this is sort of a, a side comment, but often people are interested to learn that um, App Engine apps can, can run um, in European Union data centers. So, so that's of interest to people. And, and your data at rest is, is stored in the EU when you use an EU data center. And so when you set up your App Engine app, you can specify that you want it to run in EU data centers. Thanks. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, hello. Um, just previously to your talk, we had one about DevOps. So I was trying to think about App Engine with this approach. And my question is, what kind of tool you use to monitor our application when they are on the App Engine? For example, if I, if I want to receive a direct alert by email when one of my user meets uh, an, some kind of hero, what can I use in the App Engine? I don't have the whole skin on that one, so can you talk about it? I didn't entirely understand the big question. Could, could you rephrase it? Yeah. My question is, what kind of tool can I use to monitor my application when this application is on the App Engine? Because, for example, if I use my own server, I would have some kind of a Jenkins or stuff like that who send me an alert, but mm -hmm. in the App Engine, I cannot plug my Jenkins, so what can I use? Uh, so so I, I believe there has been successful Jenkins integration with, with App Engine. And there are, um, for the most part, so far, this is, solutions to this have tended to be basically third-party tools like that. So, so there's the admin um, console for, for your App Engine app. And you can get a lot of information out about what's going on there. But if, if you're wanting alerts and um, monitoring, people tend to hook in third-party tools to do that. We have a logs API that, that lets you programmatically access the logs. Um, and and I, I think we, we don't have, um, we sort of don't have one integrated answer for how to do that. Okay, that thank you. So basically you just plug your third-party tool into the logging API and monitor the logs that way. In terms of the service stability, we do have uh, App, uh, we, do, we do reports on any incidents that happen with App Engine, any downtime. So there's various aliases you can uh, subscribe to, but downtime is very rare. And it's normally only, only affects a very small part of the uh, service. Uh, but that will be alerted to you via email. Any more questions? Yes, hello. Uh, I suppose you are using uh, uh, um, a server that looks like Apache, or is this is it a fork, or how do you have control on, for example, rewrite rules and things like that inside? So how does App Engine work under the hood, basically? What you're asking? Um, how do you how can you modify the behavior of the the web server? Right. Okay. So. We have our own specific runtime uh, that provides the services, and we have complicated algorithms to handle the scalability, the implementation of instances. We have this process called an app master that determines where your application will, will run and how many servers on, on, how many servers will run your application. Uh, so we have a very tight system that controls the way your application is deployed everywhere. I, I think if you were to look at the runtime where the application actually run, it wouldn't look very similar to anything that you know. It wouldn't look like Apache, it wouldn't look like uh, Jetty. Uh, it could be some flavor of Jetty maybe under the hood, but ultimately it probably wouldn't look, it look very familiar to you. Uh, because this kind of thing, uh, App Engine is fairly opinionated in the way it runs, so we need to have a lot of control over the way it works. So we've had to modify everything to, to, to work the way we need it to work. So that's pretty much how it works under the hood. Okay, did that answer your question? I did it answer your question? I, mm, yes, you, you part, part, uh, partially replied with uh, 
the rewrite rules um, is one typical example that we are using often in a web server, right. in a web server so that we redirect, for example, everything to one single entry point. Okay. So how, how can we do that? So that's done um, in part in the app.yaml file where you define the, the handler mappings. And in part um, with PHP, it, it needs to be done on the script end as well. So, so some of the rewrite, rewrite logic needs to be pushed to the scripts. But the app.yaml file is, is kind of roughly analogous to an HT access file. There, there's not a one-to-one -one mapping, but it, it shares much of the same functionality. I think when Amy talks about uh, task queues as well, we have these, we effectively use webhooks, we use these push queues. So we have a, a parameterized URL that gets invoked by, uh, <coughs> pushed onto the task queue, and that is read by working businesses that process it. So that will be a handler, interesting again, as uh, Amy described as well. So we can pretty much handle any kind of dispatch that you need. So you can, you can set up quite complicated, complicated routing and routing, sorry, and uh, control it that way. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Okay, cheers, thanks. Anymore? Okay, well, thank you so much today. Thank you for coming today. Uh, it's kind of late. I hope you're all going for a beer or something afterwards. And wish you luck. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.